Right. Thank you for the invitation. It's been, it's been great uh, to attend the talks here in, in Paris. Paris is also great. Um, and I would like to do, use this, um, this talk to bring a few ideas across. One is, um, in astronomy, we have often the situation that our signals are not clean, meaning that there's a foreground and a background. There's a, maybe a CMB is your background, maybe dust is your foreground, and you care about those things. But we have many situations in which the conversion from a map or an image to a catalog-based quantity, such as, say, the flux of a galaxy, is relatively ambiguous. Uh, so it cannot be made with arbitrary precision because you can't separate different sources. And this is when source separation actually becomes interesting. So first, first takeaway message here is never trust a catalog you haven't created yourself. Um, there will always be things in the catalog that are not supposed to be there, that you don't think are there. Um, and what, I'm, what, uh, what I work on uh, with people in Princeton and, and elsewhere is finding ways basically any means necessary to tease out more information from the underlying data that we can then transport into some, you can call it summary statistic or catalog entry or something of the kind. And this is why um, I prefer these days, I prefer proximal methods and I'll go through that because I think they're very elegant for constrained optimization, but also networks um, have their, their role to play and I think it becomes very interesting to connect the two. All right. So what we'll see here is an image from HSC, the ultra deep field. Um, that's some of the deepest imaging you can find up in, in the optical from the ground. And uh, this is characteristic of how LSST will look in the future in terms of seeing, in terms of depth, also in terms of filter coverage. So if we zoom in here, we see many features. Um, I think you can still see that even with the lights on, but there are many features um, of extended galaxies that are remarkable. So you can see, for instance, here there are kind of uh, star-forming knots in the outskirts of a, of a relatively diffuse disk. Up here we have some tidal effects, some tidal uh, stripping of this red galaxy, probably around this, this larger galaxy here. There's also some tidal interaction happening here. And I can, it's safe to say that none of the features are, well, very few of those features would make it into a normal catalog. If you search, say, the HSC database for tidal tails, you won't find any because they're not there. Uh, even here, right, um, if you were to search for, for um, if you wanted to have a sample of galaxies with star forming uh, knots in them, this is not trivial to get. It's because there is, no, uh, there is no easy translation from the pixel data to a catalog based summary. So this matters in a few different ways. For cosmology, we don't necessarily care about those big grand design galaxies, um, but we care about the carpet of galaxies underneath here. And so source separation becomes really critical if about 50% of the galaxies have overlap, noticeable overlap with their neighbors. And another number to take away here is that in 15% of the cases, you won't even see that there's a neighbor there that affects its, uh, its, its presence, its shape, its flux. So these are relatively large numbers for precision cosmology. And that means that photometric redshifts need to uh, acknowledge that. It also means that weak lensing needs to be made robust against the presence of neighbors. And source separation is also relevant there. So they, they are those two regimes where even in, in galaxy images, you may care about, say, a SED decomposition of, of, uh, of an extended galaxy, or you care about the fact that even your faint fuzzies uh, that we need for weak lensing purposes um, will need some form of source separation. However, source separation is a really common problem. Uh, it's so common that it has a, actually a casual name. Um, it's the cocktail party problem. Uh, and arises here, so this is a view of uh, Friday 5 p.m. Sherry at Princeton. Um, and uh, for instance here, this is Jim Gunn. Uh, and uh, so you can see that there's a lot of people talking at the same time and the cocktail party problem is to isolate a speaker in a room of speaking people. And if you think about how we do this, uh, and say how humans do that, is there are two, F, um, two aspects of this. First, we have two channels to listen in, two ears. So we have directional hearing that allows us to uh, at least direct our attention to one part of the, uh, or some part of the room. And on top of that, we use prior information. Um, most of us lip read when we um, look at the speaker. This is how we can identify what the speaker says. So there's prior information um, in there about what we are about to hear. 
And that's exactly the two aspects that you can use for source separation all the time. You have multiple channels and you have prior information. So multiple channels come in here. Uh, multiple channels come in here because we have multi-band information. So there's an object that is apparently redder, there's an object that is apparently bluer, and they overlap at some noticeable fraction. And if we split this up into multiple channels from the G to the, I, to the Z band, you can see that in here on the blue side, the blue object is obviously uh, prevalent and uh, at least comparably bright. But if you go into redder channels, this blue object disappears. And the fact that you see a difference between the two objects uh, in different filters can be used as a distinguishing factor that allows us to separate them. The mathematical formalism I like for that is called matrix factorization, and it's very, uh, very simple and elegant. Um, it's also around for quite a while. And so in nonlinear, um, it's a nonlinear function. It's bilinear, so it's the most benign nonlinear function you can make. And the two matrices here are um, one for the amplitude, that is the amplitude of a single component in, uh, in uh, any given channel. For, um, for multiband images, this is the SED of an object, is in that, uh, in that matrix. And then there is the S is the shape matrix or the morphology matrix. In our case, that would be the two-dimensional distribution of light of that component. And then obviously there's noise on that. If the noise is Gaussian, you end up with a, a standard quadratic loss function, and we will try to optimize that loss function. So if you look at this more closely, you can um, also write this in, in this way. I think it's even more obvious to see it this way. Uh, it's a finite number, it's a finite sum of components, each of which has an SED and a morphology. And you notice there is no, that's an outer product here, there is no crosstalk between them. And in essence that means that the morphology here is not band dependent. And if you think about that, that allows us to, that's a, it's a massive simplification of the problem. If you think of the, the dimensionality of the space we're exploring, that's kind of the pixel space, two dimensional, and there's a number of channels, so you get that cube. It's what, um, what, if you work with an integral field unit, that is kind of your canonical data frame. It's the, um, it's the, uh, the hyperspectral image. It's an image cube. And what we've done is, instead of um, describing every single element in it, we've we made blocks of those. So we're, um, there's basically a bunch of pixels having a uh, consistent set of SEDs, and that's a massive compression. So matrix factorization is often used for compression purposes, um, but it also it does make physical sense here, because we believe, uh, it's, it's commonly believed, that you can describe galaxies as a finite sum of stellar populations. So a bulge, for instance, is a different stellar population from the disk of the galaxy, a star forming region in the disk is a different stellar population. And so even for extended objects uh, with multiple stellar populations, this recipe is very good. It's very appropriate. All right. The problem remains that the number of, uh, say, data uh, vectors we have to constrain this is substantially smaller than uh, the number of unknowns we have. So imagine we have a situation in which we have, uh, say, three band data, but there are eight uh, sources in it. There are eight components scattered over that. Many of the source separation techniques that, um, that are commonly used can't deal with a situation like that. They're typically limited to a number of components or a number of sources equal to the number of different channels you have. Uh, so independent component analysis is an example where at least in the default um, form um, you're limited to the number of channels. But there is no limit of that kind is in here, right? This is a sum, um, sum over components. It could be as many as it wants. There's no inherent limitation in the method to, uh, to the number of channels. But the problem then arises is that the problem is obviously under constraint. And that brings, the, brings with it the need to add penalty functions. I will uh, call them G type functions and F for the, for the cost function, for the loss term. Now we need to optimize something like this and, and that brings us into a regime of mathematics that's uh, it's called constraint optimization. There are various ways of doing that, um, and I will present uh, the, the proximal, uh, the, the way of doing this with uh, proximal methods for two reasons. First, I think they're extremely elegant, they're very powerful and, and simple. And second of all, they were developed in France, so it's, a, it's, it's kind of nice to bring it back. Uh, it comes from, a, from work by uh, Jean-Jacques Moreau in the 1960s. Uh, he was a professor at Montpellier, and um, so it's, uh, 
whenever I hear someone talking about them, they, have, they tend to have a relation to friends. When they know about proximal operators, it is very, um, they have been more common in the last few years um, because the, in the machine learning field, they're also being picked up. But for a long time, it was a, a relatively isolated and, and not well-known field. However, I think it's extremely elegant and, and very powerful. And, and, and so I'll uh, explain two algorithms of how to do this. Imagine you have a constraint function that says your solution is positive. And you would express that constraint function by an indicator that says that um, the cost is zero if it is not negative and it's infinite uh, elsewhere. Think about that jump here between at zero, uh, it is non-differentiable and on the other side is even infinite. So if you run this into a standard optimizer, it will, it will crash, it will bomb, um, because it, can't, it can't, either can't handle the, the non-differentiable part or it won't uh, want to have, to have infinite values there. So you pre, um, basically you, you saturate this and set it to some value that is not quite infinite, um, you can do tricks like that, but there's a way more elegant way. Uh, and come on. and that is to hide that non-differentiable um, aspect of this function in a proximal operator, and that's the definition of it. So it's the minimum of this g function, this is this function, plus what is called a proximal term here, and that just says that um, from this argument x, you, stay, you solve for the minimum of this joint function in the vicinity of x. So you stay as close to x as possible while still minimizing the g function. Okay. So this looks actually quite, I mean, this is not um, overly complicated, but it begs the question, we've just added basically another optimization in here, another minimization as part of this. So how does that help? And it helps because there's a very simple recipe of solving that. So imagine we have a way of expressing this then there is a proximal gradient method that allows us to find and, uh, the minimum of f plus g together by this simple sequence here. So you start with some uh, position, you walk downhill according to the gradient of f with some step size here, and then you throw the result of this gradient update, you throw that into the proximal operator. What it does is this proximal operator will ensure that you are in the solution space allowed by that function. And the kicker about that is that for many, there's a, a wide variety of um, constraint functions that have an analytic proximal operator. They tend to be actually relatively easy to, to, uh, to evaluate. So an example here uh, would be one L1 functions, positivity constraints, L2, maximum entropy, I calculated that recently. So you can have a maximum entropy constraint things of the kind of uh, total variation constraints. So um, many of the constraints that are not differentiable are easily expressible this way. And then think about the flexibility you have in this, right? Once you can calculate the gradient of your function f, it doesn't actually matter what kind of constraint you have as long as you can make it proximal. So as long as you can write down the proximal operator for it, uh, you have a constraint optimization uh, scheme. It makes it extremely flexible. It means that I don't have to state what kind of constraint you can put on your solution. Um, you, can, you can do this yourself. Right. And uh, just as a, as a very simple example, the positivity constraint, if we go through that, uh, you can immediately see how that works. So imagine we have a convex function with a minimum on the negative side. So this is zero here. We start over here. We walk downhill for a few steps. And over here, the proximal operator doesn't do anything because it's up in g is 0 on the positive side, so nothing happens. And now we move over in this last step. We move over to the, to the negative side. What this minimization says is we take the nearest thing there is that still satisfies the minimization of g. And that just means that from here, you move back to here. Your next gradient step would want to go over there. And the proximal operator would move you back here. At this point, you are converged. That's it. This is a one-line constraint optimization problem and, and a solver. Um, I still wonder why this isn't taught as the first thing for constraint optimization. Yeah. Another way to implement constraints is by taking a log mm -hmm. and then you just go again. So yeah. What's wrong with that? Nothing. I mean, why, why 
Um, it's better, I would say it's better in part because you don't have to think about the transformation you would want to do. So um, for me, for instance, I'm, um, I write a code that allows um, people to do source separation. I don't know what kind of constraints they would like to put on the solution. So I can't pre-imagine uh, pre what kind of transformation they may want to need. So oh, that, Positivity is one where you know, so when it's just positivity and I declare that all solutions be positive, then I would make that transformation and it, it's just fine. I'm not arguing that you can't do it elsewhere. I'm not arguing that this replaces all other methods of constraint optimization. It just gives me a framework that allows me to put any sort of constraints that can be expressed as a proxim operator and I don't have to change the algorithm for doing it. So that allows you as a user for, for my code to, um, to think about the kind of physical constraint you would like to put at the solution um, without having to think about the transformation you want to do. And I would, I think um, it is fair to say that um, there will be cases of constraint types um, for which it is very hard to come up with a transformation that satisfies the, um, the need. Positivity is simple. So a different example of, of doing this, maybe that gives you already an, an, an example that may be harder to, to uh, do by a transformation um, approach is uh, this is a, I'm trying to differentiate, I'm trying to go to the minimum of this function, this minimum is white here, um, and I would like to excise the inner part of that circle. It's, I mean, this is a contrived example, don't get me wrong, but it, it tells you what, what's happening. You walk down the gradient here until you hit the, um, the circle. The next gradient step would move you inside of that circle, and the only thing that happens is that you pick the nearest, the proximal operator would pick the nearest point from somewhere in here on the surface of that circle because that's still allowed. And so it does that the entire time. So it basically um, every gradient step would go into the in interior of that circle, the proximal operator moves you out of there. And eventually that um, restriction isn't relevant anymore and you move in, that's it. So I'm not sure how I would express that by transforming the variables. Anyway, there's another one. Um, what happens if another algorithm is commonly in use? Um, I think we've seen it in a previous talk, um, but just abbreviated, I would like to expand it a little because it's also very convenient. Imagine you have, so we're trying to optimize a two block situation where you have this A matrix and the S matrix. And now you would like to have a constraint, a penalty function in a transformed space. So this G could be any linear transformation um, that you have. So it could be the Fourier, um, it could be um, a wavelet transform, it could be whatever you want. But you would like to express it as a, um, in that transformed space. So think about cases like Jean-Luc talked about um, sparsity in the, in the wavelet domain. That's exactly what you can do. So this would be, it would be an L1 but in the transformed domain. And the algorithm for doing that um, is based on a, a Lagrangian multiplier idea. And what you have is uh, these two functions are expressed slightly differently uh, in what's called the consensus form. So you have, now you have three variables, but you require consensus that the z variable is, um, is equal to g times s. And then what happens is um, it, that's what, what's called the alternative direction, direction method of multipliers and it's based on a Lagrangian multiplier and this lambda term is in fact this multiplier. And it comes with uh, three equations. There's an S update that minimizes F. Ignore that stuff but basically you can see there's a proximal um, term over here, this quadratic term over here. There's a second equation that minimizes G, so you minimize F and G. And there is one equation that ties them all together um, so that both of those um, optimize the same thing eventually. What can be shown is that that's a very flexible scheme. Um, both of these updates here are expressible as proximal operators. Right? Um, they, they are not directly proximal operators just of S. They are decorated with, with some additional things, but that's irrelevant. It's still just a proximal operator um, designed and based on the function f and g. And you can have, because there's a lot of um, wiggle room, there's a lot of slack in how you solve this in the end. You can have multiple constraints, and uh, we wrote a paper about this, how to extend ADMM on, on multiple constraints. And the difference is, you can, uh, the visual difference is that um, you walk along this, this path of the gradient, and you can see that the first step actually went into it. Um, and then there is a response force that puts it out of it, and kind of jiggles around a little, it's maybe hard to see. But it jiggles around a little, 
and, um, and then does the same thing again. So it's, there's a softness built into it, which comes from the fact that this Lagrangian multiplier needs to catch on that there's a, there's a, a second term. And this softness allows us to put multiple constraints on it and still have a convergent solution. It turns out that ADMM is very fast um, for the initial, um, for the initial um, uh, finding of a, a, a close to a, a minimum solution of FNG and then becomes relatively inefficient. Uh, so if you were to count the numbers of, of um, points and samples along this track here, it's actually fewer than the, in the PGM example. Um, and that's kind of this, this ability of ADMM to be, it's, it's fast and loose, so to speak. Um, but it won't get you to a, uh, to a closed solution um, uh, quickly in the end. So it's something to, to start off an, uh, a optimization, uh, specifically if you have to be in the transformed domain. Right. The interface really is simple. So these proximal operators for the circle here is, is really a few lines. And the only thing it does is it, it calculates whether you're outside of some radius. And if you're not outside, it projects you onto that radius, and that's it. Um, so uh, there's code for doing that. It's up on, on my GitHub page. You can, you can experiment with this. I encourage you to do so, because whenever you hit a constrained optimization problem, I find these um, algorithms extremely convenient. If you want to do something um, for astronomical data, um, that's an example. The differences from, say, straight up optimization with proximal algorithms is that we work um, as a basis, we work on images, and we need to have transformations such as PSF convolutions and translations where you don't know exactly where the source is. So there are additional operators that we express specifically for images, and this is what, what uh, Scarlet brings with it. It's built in there. What you see here is a uh, set, again, from the HSC Ultra Deep, uh, a number of pre-identified components, um, I think somewhere around 30 or so, and we fit them simultaneously all at the same time, and each of those components only has one SED. So there's a spatial variability, but there is no change in color of those components. And um, it's hard to see here, but the, re um, the recovery, even for large galaxies, is remarkably good. Because most of, even the large galaxies have, uh, most of their flux come out in a relatively well-defined uh, spectral regime. It's also why photometric redshifts also tend to work um, in, in a similar way, um, uh, irrespective of where you measure the photometry of a galaxy. It's not quite true, but in detail, you really expect a bulge in here. And uh, many of those have indications of bulges. I'll come to that in a minute. Um, but even that simplified scheme is very powerful. So we tested this scheme in, in a paper that um, I wrote this year, where our constraints were each of those emitters is non-negative. So it's a, it's a pure emissive um, process. They just add photons. Uh, each of them is monotonic in the radial direction. So um, if you were to go out um, radially, um, it is, uh, it's declining. And it is symmetric uh, under a rotation of 180 degrees. Both of those constraints are heuristics. They're not. Uh, we know that galaxies tend to obey them, but they are not uh, set in stone by any means. Um, and I'll come to that um, because this is, I think, where networks could be incredibly useful. However, uh, we demonstrated that um, this scheme outperforms the existing deep blender that LSST uh, implemented by uh, a sizable margin. I still believe that there is uh, some, uh, some room, quite a bit of room for improvement. But you can do more with that. So here we have a situation, a mixed uh, situation that a student uh, working with me, um, Max Jordi, investigated. And uh, it is a, a galaxy with an AGN in the center. The AGN creates a jet. The jet um, basically ionizes the material at the, um, and interacts with the ambient uh, material and creates this, uh, this green, uh, what's called an extended, um, extended emission line region. And we wanted to separate this, um, this uh, emission line region from the underlying host. So what we knew is the spectrum of this emission line region, um, they were identified um, by spectroscopy. So we could identify what its uh, broadband SED ought to be. And so we set one of the proximal operators just said that whatever photometry you give me, I'll project it onto, that, onto this particular set of colors. So it's basically, in this high dimensional color space, this was one point. And uh, so the, the nearest uh, neighbor, obviously, is just that one point, because there's only one point allowed. But that's a valid proximal operator, too. Uh, 
And uh, we had a free form um, description of the underlying galaxy. It was uh, chosen to be monotonic. We saw it was not symmetric, so we uh, left it open. And that's what you get. So you get the extended emission line. You get the host galaxy. Hard to see it there is an interloper up there that's, that we also modeled as part of this. And that allows you really to be very flexible about the kind of constraints you want to put. So if you have, for instance, insight into the photometry of your target population, then you can identify and search for those. And that's exactly what we do in the follow-up work, is we now look at, we basically have a template of how um, those emission lines could um, present themselves in broadband photometry, and now we go search for them in HSC. So that's one of these examples. Um, I would like to use this now, uh, since we've, it, it's impossible to have a talk in a conference like this without talking about neural networks, so I'll, I will fold them in. Um, and the way to do this is, it's, it's remarkably simple. And this derivation is, is, exists for a few years, but I think it has, been, has not been uh, received widespread attention. That's the definition of the proximal operator. And if you think now of a situation where you have where x is given by some underlying uh, true value plus some um, additive noise. And we assume that this additive noise is Gaussian, so it's, it's, uh, log is just a square. Then the posterior is the, the log of, up, um, of whatever uh, this, the distribution of g is, so that's the, the prior, um, with this quadratic term. Now, the maximum, uh, the maximum uh, posterior value is obviously minimizing this function. And as you can see, that's exactly the same thing as a proximal operator for log g. That's it. So that means you can express anything that is, um, that is a, um, a map estimate. You can interpret this. A map estimate under Gaussian noise is identical to a proximal operator. Just think about this, right? This is, this is quite, quite clever because it just says that um, the reason you are not at the right location is because noise was added to your problem. But the, the prior here is noise-free, is in the noise-free space. That's it. And that allows you to do an um, even wider variety of things that are um, proximal operators, such as uh, you can project onto, say, a template library of surge types. I've done that. So now all of your galaxies can only um, have solutions that look like surge profiles. It's not very clever to do this, but you can do it. Um, but in the context of what we've heard at this conference, right, it is absolutely feasible, and uh, Francois and I have talked about this, it's absolutely feasible to express this prior by a GAN and use the denoising properties of a GAN to, um, to express this as a proximal operator. So you can bring those two um, ideas together, and you have the flexibility, again, you have the flexibility of designing your proximal operators any way you want, including plugging in an entire GAN into it. So why haven't we done that yet? Um, and it brings me to the last point in my uh, talk, the last kind of aspects of, of this talk, is we have a fair amount of difficulty just knowing how many objects there are. And it comes by the name um, of unrecognized blending. There's a paper by Will Dawson from a few years ago, and um, it's summarized in this example. This is a ground-based image with, taken with Subaru. That's the same scene in HST, and you can clearly see that there are three objects. From ground, this looks like one elliptical object. So what can you do about this? Or actually, first of all, how important is that? I sort of gave away the, the key message here already. 15% um, of the objects in a ground-based Subaru-like uh, survey that goes to magnitude 27, which is the characteristics of LSST, 15% of those objects will have a neighbor near enough that you can't distinguish them. And the consequences of this is there's an extended or a broadened ellipticity distribution, which is bad for uh, cosmic shear. There's also a, um, as a question whether we can throw them out, we can diagnose this somehow. This is something I investigate with a senior student. There's a higher failure rate for photosees, unless you do something like the multi-source photosees solution that Alan talked about. But if you, if you don't do this, there's a higher failure rate, um, also for the shapes, because they are more erratic. They, as a consequence, you get biased photometry and hence problems in the photometric redshifts. <coughs> 
And um, you tend to bias your photometric redshifts if you don't do anything clever. And we are right now looking into how bad that gets if you weren't doing anything about the unrecognized blend rate in photo Z. So if you, if you have a biased photometry, you get a biased photometric redshift estimator, um, how much does that matter for cosmic shear experiments? I can't tell you yet, but we've seen that the photo Z distributions are visibly different. So we haven't propagated that all the way through, but it is a concern. Whenever you try to do something with precision on top of it, uh, something like precision cosmology, and 15% of the objects are not what they seem, you should reconsider. It doesn't mean you should give up. It just means that you need to be careful. So what can we do about this? We can d start digging into the residuals. Uh, it may be hard to see, but there are residuals left over. So in 19 or so, you may see this red, this red spot here comes up in the residuals over there. So what I subtracted is the one component model I showed you before. And also in the cores, it's even harder to see, but there's a red core in here, in there, in there. So these are the bulges of extended galaxies. So you expect that there is something. Now, what we've done here is to uh, train, and when I say we, I mean uh, Somya um, uh, Kamat from Stanford, um, has started looking into the residuals of the Scarlet model. And tries to find a predictor for the location of an undetected object. So imagine we have a situation like here, where there is one object detected. Uh, in fact, we tested that there's only one object detected. Um, over here, uh, we will model this one object that gets you this object here. That's the scarlet representation of it. And then we subtract it. And you see these, what we call color dipoles. They can, be, they can look more complicated than this, but um, that's the canonical way they, they look um, if you have a uh, differently colored object on the side. And the different colors are normal because most of the projections are along the line, so most of the blends are along the line of sight. They, they have no physical interaction. So the, the task is you get this model and this, so you, we feed two, um, two images into a uh, into neural network um, that has a, it's called a mask um, um, net RC, mask RCN, I think is the uh, is the name of this. It's a development by Facebook, and it tries to identify features in, um, in the incoming data. And we trained it to identify the extra feature. So we needed to give it the model too, so it doesn't hone in on the main model. So we feed in the model and the residuals, and we only want to um, have an analysis of the residuals. I think that's a very good way of um, going about it, because we have not too much of an understanding why there are residuals. We would like to have some mechanism of identifying meaningful residuals without having to come up with a physical model for that. Again, right, um, it's already isolated, so if there is a significant residual, the network should be able to pick it up well. And it turns out that it does. It is remarkably good in picking out residuals like this, and it also works in cases where we have multiple objects in the frame. So this is something that um, uh, some of you will write up very soon, but I wanted to show you um, already because I think this is a, a really powerful way of going forward. That is something we can do on LSST alone, but the, the last part of my, my title slide was what you can do with superior data. That brings me to this, to, this, uh, to this option of being able to combine ground and space-based imaging. So this is an image from DES of a galaxy cluster. That is the same galaxy cluster with HST. And you benefit enormously by the increased spatial resolution you get in here. So there are many things that you barely see, or you barely see at least as distinct objects in the ground-based data, where it is very trivial to see that in, in space. So only if we had space-based coverage over, say, half the sky. Um, yeah, we do, or we will at least. That's the, the coverage map um, we expect for LSST and Euclid. What you can see here is up to here, that's equatorial, is what LSST is supposed to observe down to minus 60. And what you see here, um, everything in yellow but not in blue, is what Euclid is supposed to cover. There's a massive overlap um, in outside of the galactic plane and the ecliptic exclusion zone. So we can assume that for the majority of, um, of the areas that are interesting for cosmological analyses, meaning outside of the disk, there is an overlap between LSST and Euclid. So the question is, what can we do with that? 
It's a question we tried to answer in a paper here um, that is specifically for LSST and Euclid. But there's even more happening um, when you fold in W first, who currently, at least nominally, tries to uh, will observe something like a 2000 square degree patch. Um, again, in this overlap area somewhere in here, um, it's almost guaranteed that the bulk of the W first high latitude survey is in the footprint of LSST. Um, but there is even the possibility of extending the W first footprint and make it wider. And that possibility gave rise and was the, the motivating part for a joint processing study in a tri-agency effort from NASA, NSF, and DOE. Um, you can see this is all American. But it includes, um, and the thinking certainly includes, what we can do with Euclid data. Um, if Euclid has to become public um, for, for this to happen, so be it. But I would, it would be great if we could work this out um, in some level um, so that we can have uh, some data sharing agreement. I won't go into that. This is political. I don't care. Um, but it would be nice if we had it. However, um, what you can do with this is you can bring basically multiple data streams into the same likelihood evaluation. So you don't depend on the prior so much. And the way to do that, the way to think about that is, again, I'll bring up this cube from the this hyperspectral image cube because it shows you that we are already, with, with Scarlet and these um, kind of matrix factorization schemes, we are already in the right space of doing that. So uh, just bear in mind, this internally, we are reconstructing a compressed version of this three-dimensional cube. And the only thing that happens in terms of uh, what an imager does to that is, so a regular broadband image would basically flatten the channel direction so that you only have a few broadband uh, channels multiple ones of those, um, but you get a good observability in the, in the um, pixel direction. And if you have a space-based imager, it just means that you have more in the pixel direction and possibly fewer in, uh, in the frequency direction. But these are aspects of the same data cube. So as a, a joint model of those must be possible. And again, the only thing that happens between different observations is you may need to, or you will need to match the PSF but the PSF is a linear operator, so um, this is just a matrix mapping here. You may want to do things like translations if, for instance, if uh, the object is centered or if an object is moving between frames. But translation is also just an, a linear operator. Uh, I'll skip over this. Um, in detail, you have to worry about undersampling, um, and I know that Jean-Luc has um, as ideas of, of doing um, this better than, than here, but the, the, the problem, I think, remains that you have to worry about um, a full deconvolution because of um, undersampling effects. Anyway, I'll ign um, ignore that. The point is um, these mappings are all linear mappings. The same is true if you have multiple observations at different resolutions. So what you have to do in between is a resampling from one resolution to another. And the way to think about it correctly is that um, the model intrinsically now lives in the high resolution, has basically it's a high resolution version of the, the scene. And if you then, which would be say um, the resolution of Euclid. And if you then want to go to LSST, you basically downgrade that image and resample it. You then convolve it with the PSF and that gets you a LSST-like image. So this resampling is um, ideally, um, and in the perfect world, you would do a sync resampling, but you might want to do something more compact to make it faster. Any way you do this, it is a linear operation, and you can see how this goes. Right? So it's another linear operation, the resampling um, for the observation L, and that's it. There's one thing left over, that's the, the channel direction we haven't covered yet. And that, uh, is, that happens if you observe, for instance, in different uh, broadband filters that are not identical. Uh, even if they cover kind of the same wavelength range, um, they are different in detail. So for instance, here you see the filter set of DES and the filter set of HST. And while there is broad agreement between at least a few of those filters, they are not the same in detail. What you can do is, what you want to do is that you have high enough resolution in the channel direction. So you basically have synthetic channels that you then map onto the broadband channels by a filter overlap calculation. So this is why there is a filter mapping, a projection onto the filters here. Again, just a linear operation. 
but you require the SED to be well sampled. And at this point, you would like to have, the reason for that is um, if you have a line at the edge of one of those filters and uh, you don't have enough resolution to see the line, you may not know how that uh, same spectrum would look with a slightly shifted filter. So does it fall out of that filter or is it in the filter? So you need um, to have the high resolution for spectral lines. And brings me to the last extension that one can think of. Uh, and that would be really data fusion by using an imager and a spectrum, specifically a slitless spectrum, so where you have spatial resolution in one direction and it's dispersed in the other direction. So what you see here is, uh, that's a simulation uh, color-coded. Uh, the object would be here and it's dispersed along this direction. You get overlaps of, um, of neighboring objects in the dispersion direction, but overlaps are, uh, that's what the, what the system can handle just easily because it's a source separation part and we're doing this already. So I, um, the overlap is not worrying, but what it gets you is effectively a spectrum at every position. It's not a clean spectrum, um, but again, we can handle that. And that gets you um, to a high spectral resolution. The point here is that WFIRST, Euclid, and um, the, that acronym, if you haven't seen that, that is the Chinese Space Station Optical Survey. Uh, they're all planned with uh, grisms or prisms on board. And so um, the data for, for a large scale coverage of um, imaging and, and spectroscopy will be available in a few years. And um, the only assumption for making any of that happen is that the sources we see in a scene, either kind of clumps of an of a individual galaxy or neighboring galaxies, are a, that you can describe this as a sum of distinct stellar populations. It's the only assumption we've made here. Um, I'll skip to this. Um, this is a question of whether we should go to TensorFlow um, for doing this, because look at this. Hmm? Um, because this is just a gradient update um, fed into a proximal operator. And in fact, there's a proximal gradient solver for L1 and L2 already in in uh, TensorFlow, but we need something uh, much more powerful than this. And so the question is, is it worth it? Uh, I'm thinking that in an audience like this, uh, most people would lean to yes. Uh, the areas where um, people are more conservative. So I'm, I'd be happy to, to uh, discuss any of those. And I will conclude on uh, the question of, or uh, on, on basically my takeaway message here is that blending is uh, common. Like the blending for multiple components that you may care about is really common in astronomy. It's common elsewhere too, but um, I think we've believed long enough that um, our objects are isolated and we can do that. And with the latest data, that's just not true anymore. It was never true exactly, but it gets worse um, because we, we basically, we push so far. The matrix sectorization is natural because you have those finite components of, um, or th this finite overlap of, of stellar components. And I think this is really natural for um, astronomical scenes. You can solve this matrix sectorization with these proximal algorithms. Um, you can extend the proximal algorithms with networks. And you can combine multiple data streams into like multiple images, imaging and spectroscopy, in order to reconstruct this high dimensional, this three dimensional hyperspectral image cube. So development of that happens in this tri-agency um, tri effort and also in my group at Princeton. And there are many low-hanging fruits you can use or you can, you can reap uh, with existing data, specifically HSC, HST, um, so ground-based plus HST. There's a lot you can do. So if you're interested, um, that's my email address. That's me on Twitter. Um, just hit me up. Thank you.